Welcome to uh, the lecture that we're, um, on uh, development constrained by sustainability. So the idea is here, we have to start taking into consideration, uh, and you should remember the sustainability lectures, or lecture, and the issue of, you know, if you make poor people rich, well, then they're gonna end up like us, and that's a problem because we pollute a lot, we use a lot of resources, okay? If everybody in the world was like us, we'd have a major problem, okay? So the idea with sustainable development is how can we move forward together, all of humanity at one time, and develop, okay? So everybody's doing well, but we don't destroy the planet in the meantime, okay? So that, that's the fundamental issue of sustainable development. Um, so we talked about earlier pollution, ecosystem services to humans. We did soil, water, air, climate. Um, we talked about the relationship between the ecological footprint and the human development index. We did all that stuff, okay? Now I'm sort of revisiting that topic and, and I'm gonna do it from an analytical perspective now, okay? Um, so to get started, um, I wanna to return to the tragedy of the commons that I had mentioned before because this is a very basic principle in this area. So the first question is, well, let's define the term. What are the commons? The commons are um, anything that is sort of shared and used by many people and they, because it's shared and used, they may get the benefits from it for free. So the classic example um, out of Hardin's original paper was uh, you have a, a, a community that has a cow pasture that they all share. So the cow pasture there, you got grass that's growing at some rate, and one guy goes out and puts his cow on the grass. He, it grazes, it's doing great, brings it back, off the market, makes lots of money. So this person benefited from the commons, okay? Other people see this and they say, hey, I'm gonna do that too. So everybody starts putting cows on the commons. And then the original people too are saying, well, I wanna make more money, so I'm gonna put more cows on the commons. And the problem is, is that can destroy the commons. Now that doesn't mean that anyone wanted to destroy the commons. <laughs> Okay, no one individual is like being evil or anything of the sort. It's just that everybody wants to use the common resource and by using it, it affects others. In other words, my adding one cow affects whether you're really gonna be able to add a cow too, okay? Now, so who cares about cows? Let's, let's talk about what the commons means in terms of the bigger picture. The climate is a commons. We breathe common air, right? And we destroy our air via, well, I drive my car to work and back every day, etc. Okay, so we're all using the commons. We're polluting the commons, we're using the commons. This is a, some of the more uh, common examples of studies are fisheries. So you've got, you know, regions where you fish, okay? And if it's overfished, you can just deplete and destroy the populations of fish entirely. You can destroy the commons. So fisheries around the world are very good at regulating the commons so they won't destroy it. This is being successfully done, actually, in some cases. Other cases are things like forests that are used, etc. I think you get the idea. So I am not going to be talking about any specific commons. I'm just going to talk about a generic commons here, okay? And the tragedy is created by overuse by everybody of the commons, okay? So we're gonna do a mathematical uh, model and uh, some computational analysis, of, and, and we're gonna focus on two questions. Um, what's the effect of overutilization of the resources in the commons? And what's the effect of population size increases? It's like more users, more farmers putting their cow in the pasture, okay? So we'll, we'll do an analysis of these two cases. Mo this model is not, this came from the literature, but it's not tuned to a specific type of resource and type of commons. It's just a generic qualitative analysis for thinking about the tragedy of the commons. Um, so we're gonna start out with a renewable common resource. We're gonna call it R of K at step K. Now, I'm not even gonna tell you what time is. I'm just gonna call it K. K to K plus one might mean, for instance, a decade. It might mean 100 years. Probably doesn't mean a microsecond. 
I don't need to worry about that. This is just a qualitative analysis. It means the patterns of trajectories matter, not the specific numbers. N is going to be the number of users or the population size. And then I've got this first equation, and this is the equation I got out of the literature for representing um, a resource. Now, I, this re, this, strictly speaking, this is a nonlinear difference equation. It's like a nonlinear differential equation. But it's easy because all it is is some algebra. Okay? So let's look at, let's pick it apart. Whenever you see something like that, you don't freak out, you just start picking it apart. And you, the way to pick it apart is usually, um, it, there's different strategies, but look, look, watch how I do this. So R of K plus one means, what will the resource be at the next step? R of K is the resource at the current step. So you see the big parenthesis is multiplying R of K. Now that big parenthesis is, well, it's gonna, we're gonna talk about this in a moment, but if that big parenthesis is bigger than one, what will happen? What happens to the resource at RK plus one? It'll go up. If that big parenthesis guy is less than one, it'll go down. Okay? So that's the first important principle. Next, when you pick these things apart, it's nice to throw out stuff. Let's throw out U of K. U of K is the utilization. That's what all the users are using in sum. So let's just throw that up for a minute by letting it be zero. And then let's look at that, that term, E to the R, one minus R of K of K. Now, for that, the first thing um, to do is to realize it's, it's, it, it, how to pick this apart. Usually you start setting various values and so forth. But realize that what does E to the whatever number look like? Plot it for me. Somebody in the air, plot it. Yes, it's, okay, so that R, how does that change the shape of that? If R is smaller, it's, if R is bigger, it's like this. So it's a rate, it's a growth rate. Little r is the growth rate of the resource. It's like how fast the grass is growing, how fast the fish are reproducing to fill the fishery up, okay? So that's what little r is. Now. If R was zero, R of K was zero, at time zero, then that's, that second term would go away, right? That's cool. Then we just have E to the R. And if E to the R, now let's think about this, E to the R. Is it possible for that number, we got, we got rid of U, is it possible for E to the R to be less than one? And then you gotta remember, pull out your calculator, mess around, whatever. Okay, so, so that's a question. But all it is is a constant gain. Whether it's above or below zero, one, we know what's gonna happen, okay? Next, now let's, let's just suppose for a minute that we know that if this is called a renewal or growth equation, well, it means that R is generally gonna go up, right? So if R is gonna go up, that means that one minus R, what's going to happen? Once, if R over K goes above one, well then it's E to the minus something, right? Okay, so that means that if it's E to the minus something, it's sort of going to decrease, right? Okay, so now that now it gets a little hard because... It's not clear just in your head about this decrease and increase thing, okay? So we're gonna do a simulation in a minute. Um, and furthermore, it's complicated by the fact that that U of K is sitting there because U of K is changing whether the big parenthesis is above or below one, right? I mean, but it's, it's kind of cool because it says, well, that equation says that if U is too big, you can easily get that number the big parenthesis guy to be less than one and therefore resources will decrease. It's obvious from the equation, it'll go down. So there's too many resources, too many users, too many, using too much resources, it's gonna deplete and the tragedy will occur. Now if you use smaller, however, then it could be that R could go up or stay the same. Of course, I didn't discuss the case when parenthesis guy is equal to one, then the resource level will stay the same. 
Okay. Um, any questions? I know that's a very heuristic analysis, but that's usually how you start with a mathematical equation, and then you sort of say, well, I'm just going to simulate this thing and see what it looks like. Okay, that's what we'll do. So here's it, here it is. I just picked some numbers, uh, R equals 0 0.5, K equal 50. I, I threw out utilization, no users, um, and, uh, and I'm going to have some different initial resource values. Now watch what happens. The first thing to look at is, is why in the world does it go into 50? Because K is 50. Well, that is, if you do the analysis, that will be the steady state value when there's no utilization. So that number on the previous slide, that K sitting up there in that equation, that's where R is going to co converge to. Okay? And, and it takes a little, little, just a little bit of math to show that. It's easier just doing simulation. Next, what is R going to do? Can somebody just tell me qualitatively? What is R, little r? What, what is little r going to do? I mean, like, let's just take little r and let's make not 0.5, but 0.1. And this is a homework problem. What, what's it going to do? Yes. Yes, it'll trend much slower. It'll, it'll spread way out. And if I make it, you know, like r equal 0.9, it'll go whoosh. Okay? Now, what's unusual about the plot when you first look at it is the following. The cases for r of k being 30, 35, 40, 45, okay, those cases, in those cases, it goes up. Okay? And, and that's because... Um, in this previous equation, for the numbers, that guy, is, the parenthesis guy, is bigger than one for those numbers. Okay, that's why it goes up. But look, what's unusual is, is it can go down too. Okay, so if I start at 70, 65, 60, or 55, it comes down. Okay, now that can be a little harder to understand you got to think about the dynamics because it's like the grass is growing up um, at a certain rate. So if uh, grass isn't a good example. Um, if I have a whole, I went out in the, Pacific, or the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Maine, took a whole bunch of fish and just put them there, okay? There's a background reproduction rate. Can you see that the total number of fish if there's too many, will decrease, actually, based on availability resources, etc. it'll actually come down. That's what this case is, okay? So that's the, the overall pattern of, of the resource trajectories when there's no utilization. You, I was asking, do you have a question? Why did you specifically pick an exponential function to? Uh, this come, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can think of a number of models that would produce the same behavior. Um, and actually simpler ones, but this is one that's used in, um, very commonly used in ecology to represent this sort of thing. It's been used for many, many situations like this. So that's why we adopt this model. Because, like, water is a common resource and it's a renewable resource to, like... If it's a what? Water hydroelectricity is it's a renewable source of energy, right? <clears throat> that doesn't grow exponentially. Then why do you model it as, as an exponential function? Uh, I, I'm using, I'm using, this is a model that's valid for a, a wide range of ecological situations, fish and so forth. It, it's certainly not going to hold in all cases. No, in fact, when I look at the equation, when I first looked, you know, looking at this equation, I thought, gee, I can, I can generate these behaviors, the same qualitative pattern as that, in a very simple way, with a linear system. But um, again, I'm going with the standard ecological model. It's, not, it's no harder to deal with it computationally. It is harder to deal with mathematically, but not computationally. Okay, so that's resources, okay? Next. Now we're going to start putting users in. They're going to start eating up these resources. So user i has utilization ui of k at step k. It's going to be a percentage of the resources at time k. You can think of it as taking a byte that corresponds to, if this is R of K, UIK, let's just, they say this is 0.001, well then you know, it's like 
0.1% of the resources it takes in a month or something like that. It's consumption. It's, it's taking the resource, okay? Now, um, the total U of K is, of course, the sum of the UIKs. You have to have the number between 0 and 1. It doesn't make sense to have negative utilization. That would correspond to adding resources. It doesn't make sense to have it bigger than 1. Why? Because then you'd consume all resources or more in one step. Okay. If the sum, if u of k is equal to 1, that means in one step, everything's eaten. Everything's gone. Okay. So somehow it makes only logical sense in terms of the model to have the number between those two. An example would be if everyone consumed the same amount, was utilizing the resource the same amount, you'd have a, a UIK as alpha over n. So if you have 10 users, everybody would be, for instance, getting one-tenth of the total. I put the alpha there, and that's a number between 0 and 1, because I don't want it to be one-tenth, because that would mean that of the 10 users, they eat everything in one step. But if I make alpha 0.01, then they won't do that. Okay, So alpha is a scale factor on sort of the rate of consumption. This is the case here where everyone is equally consuming the resources. Now, I think we all know, though, that for the commons, the typical commons, that's not happening, right? I mean, different people are consuming the resources of the commons at different rates, all right? We don't have equality. In the United States, I mean, I don't, has anybody done, did somebody, who, who, who uh, can remember their uh, ecological footprint number? If you want to be, yes. 4.4. Anybody else? 3.2. 3.2. I was 3.8. 4.8. Wow, you must be doing a lot. <laughs> so so, so the, the thing is, is you see there's this variance even in this room. Um, but you can imagine it if you're in a very poverty-stricken situation, you're barely eating, etc. You're not using much resources. You're not polluting. They're way low. Okay, so equality like this is like theoretical. Okay, this isn't happening. Okay, questions? Now, this mess of equations is much easier than it looks like. It's a repeat of a number of things we've been saying. So the first thing I want to say is that R of K, if it's less than some RD, then the commons are destroyed. In other words, if I, if I move my resources down too low, that's it. They're destroyed. Okay, it could be that our D is is uh, is near zero, for instance, um, as an example. Now, what I'm going to do is an extremely simple thing. I'm going to take this equation right here, and I'm simply going to take R of K from the right hand side. I'm going to divide through by it. I'm assuming that R of K is greater than zero. I'm going to have then R of K plus one over R of K. That's it. Okay. So when I do that. Then I've got parenthesis guy on the right. And then, of course, I'm concerned about whether this guy is greater than 1, less than 1, or equal to 1, right? Now, let's do the cases. So in a very, generally speaking, in a low utilization case, this guy will be greater than 1. And therefore, I'll have parenthesis greater than 1 which means if this is greater than 1, R of k plus 1 is bigger than R of k, right? And it goes up. Second one, trip point. That is, when parenthesis guy is equal to 1, then R of k plus 1 is equal to R of k, and it stays the same. The bottom one's the tough one. When you have high utilization, then what happens is the parenthesis guy ends up less than 1, and therefore RK plus 1 over RK is less than 1, and we decrease. And unfortunately, that's a very bad situation, because think about it. What typically, uh, assuming UK doesn't change, if it decreases at one step, guess what? It's going down the next step, too. And it's going down the next step, too. Ow, ow, ow. And you're headed off towards a problem, possibly. It may not be a problem, it may not be hit RD, but it's going down, okay? Um, so the, this situation is only gonna occur when this con last condition holds, okay? Because if it stays the same, 
and you're above RD, well, it stays the same. It's never going to hit it. It's never going to go down to it. The top situation is great because it's just going up. Okay? Questions, comments? Okay. Um, now, there's two things we want to look at. What's the impact of development on utilization? And basically what everybody knows is, is that uh, the developed world is utilizing resources at a much, much higher rate than the developing world. There's a big split. Um, now, uh, and, and also polluting um, a lot. Uh, but things are changing, right? You watch the news. China is catching up uh, in terms of, of use and pollution, et cetera, with the United States. In certain measures, we're on par right now. And uh, so, so things are changing. Um, but generally speaking, there's a lot of reason to be concerned about increased utilization, increased pollution, because people get wealthier. And if you think about it, it simply makes sense. I mean, if I'm consuming more as, as a wealthy person, okay, and of course, then I'm using more resources. I get enough money to buy a car, I'm polluting more, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's pretty clear that's a problem. So what the impact is, is increased utilization, which means if the world gets wealthier, and remember HDI is like going like this, right? It's, it's coming up, I mean, on many countries. <coughs> that means utilization's going up, okay, and it is, okay? So that's the first comment. Second comment is population impact. I think it's rather clear that as we increase population, we're straining the planet more and more in terms of utilization and pollution. I, I, that's rather obvious. Um, now, population growth is, um, you know, it's a complicated topic and, and people, you know, there's people that take various guesses from Malthus when he said it was, you know, what he said originally about population explosion to current estimates are coming out, out at a bit over 9 billion. They think the world will stabilize within a certain number of decades. It's very hard to tell. There's a lot of factors that impact that. Um, you know, in particular, education and women's rights um, impact that a lot, um, data has shown. And uh, so who knows where we're going to be population-wise, but it's pretty clear it's going up. For this class, when I got the data last year on world population from the, the population clock at the U.S. Census Bureau, 7.1 million people. I looked it up this year for this class, 7.2 billion people. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big increase. We're talking about the, the real increases. Last year, United States, 317 million people. This year, United States, 320 million people. Okay? So, so things are definitely going up. The impact at an abstract level is simply to, again, increase utilization. So. Wealth drives up utilization, population drives up utilization. So we're going to see what happens as we grab a hold of utilization, U of K, and we move it up and down. Okay? So um, what I want to tell you the answers before we look at the data. If you increase U, I think you can see that you're going to drive resources down. You got more cows in the pasture, the grass is going to eat, get eaten faster. That's all there is to it. Okay? The question is, is will we create a tragedy? Okay. Okay, so here's the, the plots. Um, and uh, what I want to do is start on the right. Ignore the left for a minute. That's sort of the technical part of it. On the right, I start out with the, um, the, the similar situation to before, but I take U of K and let it be some small number for all time and hold it constant. And what happens? You notice, see the red line there? It's below 50, isn't it? All right, so the steady state value for resources has gone down because I pushed utilization up. But, you know, it, it settles out of the value. I'm going to assume that 20 represents RD, which is the, the point of the, where the tragedy of the commons occurs, and we're safe and happy and there's no problem with low utilization. The problem is if I crank up U of K, what happens is it only goes down and settles out here. The tragedy of the, common, of, the, of the commons occurs simply because of that being above or below one. Okay, it's that easy. 
It's really that easy. Okay? The whole dynamic you have to think about in your head that matters the most is take a number. If you take, if you take the simple iterate of RK plus 1 equal alpha RK, if alpha is between 0 and 1, less than 1, then RK plus 1 will go down every time. And you iterate, and it'll, it'll keep going down. But if it's bigger than 1, it'll go up. Now, it's a little more complex because you got the parenthesis guy, but you get the point. The, being above or below 1 is what matters. Um, and so we can get, by cranking up utilization, we can destroy the commons, and, uh, which isn't good. Now, you look at the left. Now, the left is more technical. So what I've done, uh, let's look at the top plot. I dumped these equations right on top of the plot to make it really hard to read, but I think you'll get it. So here's the thing. Let's talk about the axes first. On the horizontal axis, I've got RK plus 1 divided by RK. That's our guy on the left. So we're concerned with that guy about whether he's above or below 1, right? So look, the red line, vertical line, is 1. So if I am above 1, then everything goes up. If I'm below 1, everything goes down. The question is, what's the darn blue line? Well, the blue line is our buddy. It's, it's the parentheses guy. So what it means is, is, is if I am with RK plus 1 over RK to the right of 1, do you see that the cross point there for, now I, gotta, I know you can't read the left axis, but it's R of K. The, left, the vertical axis is R of K. So if R of K is a low value and RK plus 1 over RK is above 1, that means that I'll have um, growth. Okay? On the other hand, it crosses and you go to the left-hand side, then RK plus 1 over RK is less than 1. And if RK is up there, we'll have decline. So the cross point is the crucial point. The cross point tells you when it switches that parenthesis guy from being above or below 1. Right at that cross point, it's right at 1. Okay? So it's, it's actually quite easy. Now, so you see the way I plotted this on the left, the cross point, just trace your eye from the cross point straight over. What do you run into? The red horizontal line. Because that's the equal 1 point when RK plus 1 over RK is equal to 1. And therefore, it stays constant. Okay, so, so uh, this plot shows you um, sort of the math that we were all discussing plus the actual simulations and tells you why everything's happening. You see that when I go to utilization then, what's interesting is the blue line shifts. Well, surprise. Remember parenthesis guy. It's got that exponential thing going on here. It's got U here. So U is going to move the parenthesis, right? So and the parenthesis is the blue line. So by moving on U higher, I move this line, and you see the cross point's way down here. The cross point is where it's going to settle in the end. It's, it's where the resource will end up at, right? So this is actually headed, it's still decreasing a little bit, it's headed towards that cross point right down there. Okay? So what happens? What matters is U moves the blue line up and down, changes the cross point. U, as U goes up, the blue line goes down. And that's where the resources will end up at. And they can easily end up below RD, which would correspond then to a tragedy of the commons. Okay? So this is looking at it in a, um, a number of uh, different ways using the math or uh, computation. Um, Questions. Okay, so what I was going to do is show you how to solve your homework problem. Um, so, all right, hold on a second here. I think I'm going to. Okay, so here's the program. The program that you're going to be running for the last homework problem, it's 1.35, is uh, the program uh, TOC uh, for uh, Tragedy of the Commons. And uh, it's just, it's not a Simulink diagram it's just a it's just a computer program you see it's it's pretty short um, so if you run this guy guess what there's the plots we just looked at okay now um, 
what I'm going to have you do is um, adjust um, various parameters here. Okay, so so let's just do the kinds of things I'm going to ask for. First one, remember that r equal 0.5. We said what if it's 0.1? Run. Hold on a second. It seems to be, I've kept the old um, figure to, hold on a second, I didn't do it, put in a CLF. You know what that means, right? Yeah, right there, sorry. CLF, a clear fig. Oh, it's in the loop, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> Never code in front of a class. Hold on. What what's wrong with it? Uh yeah, duh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not good at typing in front of people and coding in front of people. Okay, so like we said, it was going to be slower, okay? And um, indeed, that's what you see. Uh, no surprises, okay? Um, now, this uh, changed um, things a little bit, but overall, it's about the same. I mean, slower rate of growth made the commons get destroyed faster <laughs> and more. Why? Can someone tell me? Why was that effect there? I mean, we talked about just this effect, right? That's what everybody, somebody in the back said, you know, this is a little slower. But why is it that commons is getting destroyed, even worse, it's going down to zero? That didn't happen that bad last time, right? It's because it's like <laughs> quickly getting, quickly eating, getting where it's going, okay? Now, um, you can go back up here and uh, change this to, uh, we had said as an example like 0.8. Okay, so that, it's gonna be different, it's gonna be very fast, right? Now, notice that um, the, the sharp edges there are not a mistake. What's happening is, is it's drawing lines between points. Okay, it's a little unusual, but it's, it's still correct. It's just that it, it looks weird, okay? Um, and uh, look, it happens to be from this case that it hits right at the, um, the, the trip point of uh, um, destroying the commons um, when uh, we have that change in rate. Okay, next. Um, if I go up here, let's, what did I have this as, five? And then, of course, you know, this 50 will change a lot. Uh, let's just go to 70. Um, you know, I, your utilization, every utilization only goes up now because I only started at 70. Um, it, it's, everything's going up. Um, we're destroying the commons, no surprises, okay? So that's, that's as expected. Um, now, this guy was um, 50. Um, what I'm gonna be asking you to do is adjust these low utilization and high utilization um, cases and realize they're in two places in the code and ask you to study those um, you know so you'll adjust um, UL and I'll have you change it off of 0.05 that's the low utilization and I'll have you adjust UH for high utilization is 0.6 um, you also need to adjust those down here is 0.05 and 0.6, okay, and um, you just adjust these parameters and then just go up here and hit rerun and everything pops up, okay? So that that's all 
it's just see so all you're doing is adjusting parameters there's no need to reprogram and you'll you'll um, come to understand the various influences of higher or lower utilization on on uh, um, what's happened with the dynamics of the commons okay um, questions comments okay so uh, last section of the chapter I'm going to move away from this and talk about principles of feedback control. Um, we already had, um, for the poverty case, um, this diagram, right? And in this diagram, um, before we had person was the process and their savings, their money in their pocket. Um, the input was the spending advice, the output was wealth, the disturbance was income, random income stream, based on their work per day. Uh, and then there's a reference input, which was just the so-called uh, uh, desired wealth. And then the controller was, for instance, the PID controller that um, tried to make sure that the wealth value here ended up the same as the reference input value, the desired wealth on the left-hand side. That's what it's trying to do by adjusting the spending. Okay. So we did that uh, pretty detailed analysis of that case, but you have to understand that this diagram is really general, okay? We talked about temperature control. Well, the output then is temperature. The input to the process is, you know, like turn the heater on and off. Uh, the reference input is what's on the thermostat, and the loop works. You can do the same thing for automotive cruise control. Tons of engineering applications, okay? This is a very, very well studied uh, field with theory, applications, etc. So what I want to do is give you a brief overview of the area. So the first thing I want to talk about is this process characteristics, okay? The first thing is, is linear or nonlinear processes, okay? The dynamics of the tragedy of the commons were nonlinear. They had that exponential in there. When, you, when somebody asks you what linear means, it, it, just think of it as, as taking a variable and all you get to do is multiply by a gain and produce another variable. That's linearity in, in a nutshell. And so uh, nonlinear, well, we had an exponential function to this. That's a nonlinear function. Um, CISO, MIMO. CISO is single input, single output. That was our financial advisor. One input, spending advice. One output, wealth. But there's MIMO systems, multi-input, multi-output. So what's unusual here is, is that um, the commons is multi-input, one output. And it has all these users, okay, and they're all affecting one variable. That's, so multi-input, single output, okay. We are going to control the commons later in class. Okay, we'll come back to that. Stochastic deterministic, stochastic simply means it's random. Okay, well, random income stream for our poor person, that's stochastic then, it's, it's random, okay? And then there's deterministic. Now, in these simulations I just did with the tragedy of the commons, they're deterministic, okay? And there's no random variables in there or anything. I just assume that they're representing nature and everything's perfectly deterministic. But in nature, everything's stochastic, of course. Everything's uncertain. Um, then there's a complexity issue, and this is really important. The, the, um, the cruise controller on your automobile is relatively simple, okay? Um, but, you know, if you go to other control systems applications, it can be extremely complex. Um, for instance, aircraft control is much more difficult, and child, uh, you know non-linear, multivariable, it's much more challenging. Uh, you're, we're going to really crank up the complexity in this class, you're going to see. We're going to be modeling democracy as a feedback system. We're going to be modeling wealth distribution policy as a feedback system. We're going to do a feedback on the, the to control the tragedy of the commons, so we're going to have to control hundreds of inputs, the utilizations, to make sure we regulate and make sure the resources aren't destroyed. Okay, so complexity is a very big issue here. Next, there's properties of the process. So what I'm thinking of is, is you got this entity you call your process, the trash, the commons, the resource dynamics and utilization dynamics of the commons, or the poor person's dynamics of saving and, and spending, etc. And uh, there's a notion uh, called stability. 
Okay, so most people think of stability, the first way they think about it is they, they take a bowl, like a cereal bowl, and they take a little marble, and I set the marble on the edge of the cereal bowl, and it goes and it settles down to the bottom. That's a simple stability. That's called asymptotic stability, okay? Take the bowl, invert it, put the ball here at the top, just balance it perfectly, and then go whoop. And then what does it do? It falls off the bowl, duh. That's instability, okay? So systems can be stable or unstable, right? They're different, qualitatively very different to control if they are stable or unstable. The tragedy of the commons is not unstable. The resources will only grow to a certain amount, period. They don't grow to infinity, it doesn't make sense. You don't have an infinite number of fish in the ocean or whatever. So, but there, there are some really basic differences between those. There's also a notion of controllability, that is whether I can put inputs into the process to really change the process, and whether you can look at the outputs and figure out what's in the process. That's called observability. Uh, I've said this joke too many times, I don't know if anybody here has heard it, but I, I'm a parent, four kids. My kids are uncontrollable, most certainly, especially my daughters unobservable and unstable. A few of them, sometimes. Hard processes to control. It's absurd to even think about being a parent and thinking you control your child, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think that way. Um, next, controller functionalities. There are all kinds of controllers, okay? Um, you know, we, we actually designed a PID controller. That's a linear controller. We put in some saturations, it had some nonlinearities, okay? They're static or dynamic ones. But you know, what I want to talk about is the ones that have most interested me are actually down here in the adaptive or learning ones. I've spent a lot of time with my PhD students working on um, these cases. So imagine this, this is a well-developed field. You, can, you could take the PID guy, forget about specifying the gains. Because the gains really fit one person. So what you do is you say, you just give up. You say, I can't design that controller for, because I want my financial advisor to work for a million different people, okay? So instead what you do is you design the controller to design itself. That's adaptive or learning. So it hooks up to the person to start operating and it figures the person out. And then it, <laughs> it finds its own PID gains essentially. Okay, that's the field of adaptive or learning control. Uh, it's, it's an amazing field, and don't think it's pie in the sky. It's used in engineering all over the place. I mean, like for instance, if you're at, at uh, General Motors, I had an old friend at General Motors explaining to me how they use it. So, so they have to design like a cruise control for an automobile. In his case, it was for powertrain control. So what he does is he says, okay, I've got five lines of cars. These are millions of vehicles, and I gotta get one cruise controller is what I need. So why don't I design one cruise control that will adapt to all five lines of cars? Then I've done engineering for all of them at once. That's adaptive control, okay? Um, and there's many other examples. Planning is something we do all the time. You guys are really good at it. If you're gonna um, go to lunch uh, over on High Street, you plan your route over to High Street, right? And if it, there's a change, you know, a road is closed or whatever, you <coughs> replan. Those ideas are used in feedback control. It's called model predictive control. And all over, all over the place, and very successful in chemical process control, except, especially for MIMO systems. Okay, next. You got the process. You, you got the process. You got the controller. You link it up, and then you got another dynamical system. You got a study. So you don't want it to go unstable. You want it to behave properly. You want it to respond quickly, okay? And you want to have it be the case that, for instance, for the poor guy, that if the income stream changes off of the random assumption of randomness, that indeed it will still do good, okay? And feedback systems are always designed for that case. That's called like a, some, it's like called robustness. In other words, it's gonna work no matter what in practice, okay? Um, you can do analysis, mathematical analysis if you like math, computational analysis if you like to use MATLAB um, or some other programs maybe. 
Um, and uh, implementation, you know, you go up in the lab, you implement it. I mean, so all that's done all the time. So the examples are feedback control for finances management. We're going to be doing social justice, equality, democracy, wealth distribution, um, environmental justice. Um, we're going to do feedback control for um, not destroying the commons. So what will happen is, is we'll have these utilization changing, and we'll be controlling the system so that if utilization goes up, we'll force everyone to go down. If population goes up, we'll force everyone's utilizations to go down. We'll do things like that. And it'll move it dynamically. Okay? That's it.